Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to Deep Thoughts. You know, I don't say it as often as other YouTube channel owners, but I do appreciate you very much. It's sort of a crazy thing to have this organic moment in my life where this show comes out of the the entire endeavor, right? Sorry, I'm running out of fuel here. I'm just going to have a little private moment between the two of us here. I don't know. You know, shows like this, they don't exist without listeners. Period. They just don't. What I think is kind of funny is, if you get the show, the funny part is, is that those who don't get it, you know, they see a dude sitting in the backyard smoking cigars in black and white, which is so not techy, right? Even though it takes tech to make it happen. And when you get it, it's all about thinking and sharing ideas and having your brain massaged by a mental masseuse. That there is no real bias when it really comes down to it. I have my opinions, you have your opinions. But in the end, it's just a big deep thought that we're both having. And those that just walk by it and go, What's this guy doing it's sitting in his backyard? This sucks. And they move on. It's beautiful. We weed out by design, right? And for those of you who watch the show, uh, I know that you guys look in the background, right? And I noticed my little power strip here, my little power block in the back here, my plug-in strip is right there. It's not a strip, it's like the two outlets I use. The white one powers the camera and this orange one, again, it's in black and white, so enjoy that, powers the computer. And I have sprinkler heads that are very close to it, so I kept getting a short and the, um, the power outlet. So I wrapped it up in a little sandwich bag, and now I no longer have that issue. Boy, this is how things turn into white trash things, right? And white trash... Well, it's, it's near the subject we're going to talk about. White trash is obviously an unfortunate anomaly that occurs near where we're going to talk about. I have mentioned over and over and over, small town. I'm from a small town. That's why I have the perspective that I have. I did a uh, episode that I actually really like. It's about school playground wisdom which is a little bit like this one could be similar but this is going to be about growing up in a small town versus spending time in the city and what are the benefits of the two what are the drawbacks of the two because this is huge coming from the midwest and moving to the coastal region of california I was constantly presented with people saying, oh, you know, you're a good guy because you're from the Midwest. You tell the truth because you're from the Midwest. And I'm sitting there going, Why does that, what does that have to do with anything? Doesn't everyone want to tell the truth? Doesn't everyone want to be a good person? And the truth is, no. Depends on what environment you grow up in as to whether or not that even works at all. So, you know, technically I was born in Europe and I don't remember any of that crap. So by the time my memory really started truly manufacturing linear time, I was in Kansas. Grew up in a teeny town and named after a pilot, a land surveyor, Octave Chanute. In the mid-1800s, my town had three names. Chanute, Tioga, and New Chicago. Can't even imagine if we were going to call ourselves New Chicago. It would probably change the landscape of it. But they settled on Chanute because he, again, surveyed the land by air that determined where they were going to build this township. Now, I don't know exactly how he did that because flight hadn't been discovered yet. Okay. Now, again, in my hometown, they say that he actually discovered it before the Wright brothers. But it's the way that the Wright brothers discovered that gives them the special alkylate. He definitely mentored them. 
So a township is a six mile square. That's what a township is. And so that's what my town is. It is a township called town for short. It's based on the Santa Fe Railroad. Came through the Midwest. Now the Santa Fe Railroad runs everywhere, but we have a we had a fairly small train station that then was double widened. It's all made of brick. It's gorgeous. And it still runs through there, but it doesn't as far as I know, there's not a lot of stopping anymore. They used to have, you know, depots in town where they'd stop and reverse and wind up. I don't know if they do that anymore. The buildings that were associated with that have long fallen down. Uh, the train station is now a safari museum and I believe a library. But my whole life I have felt this beautiful benefit of having grown up in a home in a little tiny town and then the benefits and accolades of growing, going to the big city after having gone to a small town. But it's been tough for me perhaps through the sheer lack of analyzing the situation and the facts, to figure out why. Why was it better in a small town? You know. Now, I have said a thousand things in the 350 episodes that I've recorded about why. But we're going to get before the advanced concepts. We're going to talk about the basic concepts of why hometowns are great. Now, I want you to keep in the back of your mind... And again, if you're European, I apologize, or you're not American. Um, we have the Electoral College here. I'm sure there's some form of that everywhere in the planet. But there's this push to get rid of the Electoral College. And what that allows, what that would allow to have happen is that your, your elitists, right, the place where you get concentrated pedophilia, concentrated kidnapping and rape and crime, would be the mindset of human beings that would dominate the vote to give America its cultural roots and sustainability. The beautiful thing about the Electoral College is that it allows, obviously, less densely populated mid Midwest regions to contribute something that is coveted and amazing because they live a much more balanced life in the Midwest. They're slower, they don't prioritize money, and they're just all about the human condition, right? You know more people in the Midwest, you interact more in the Midwest. In the big city, you know less people, and therefore you can become perverted and perverse and strange, right? Now, does the Midwest have its weirdos? Of course, of course. But be careful what you, you know, see in movies versus what is real. So many times I hear people talk about, you know, not quite the deplorable statement because no one likes that statement, but, you know, back in an ass backwards, blah, blah, blah. I saw Deliverance. I saw Carnival. I saw various series on TVs that portrayed all these people like Bumpkins to play the dueling banjos as a birthday song. That's not the case. Okay. Yes, you can find weird places like that, but it's rare. Okay. But the main thing about the Electoral College is to preserve the sensibilities that aren't so hastily renewed and, you know, burned out of existence that the West Coast does and the East Coast does. The West Coast and East Coast have a cultural uh, burden in that they're supposed to invent the next thing, the next music, the next fashion, the next everything. And because they're renewing very quickly, the problem is they can renew badly. Now, they'll get themselves out within 10 years, even if they make a bad mistake. They pick a bad form of music, but they go balls in with all of their money, and it's going to be there for 10 years. The Midwest hangs on to the best of the best and only changes if there needs to be a change, meaning it doesn't work anymore, so then they change, you know. It's not broke, don't fix it kind of thing, right? That's their idea. But I'm going to go back to birth, Okay. Now, let's pretend I was born there. Got there about two and a half, three years old. I remember my first memory there, I remember being three in the snow. Now, what is the average psyche of a kid? A little kid, boy, girl, doesn't matter. They only think reality is as big as the room that they're in. 
When you take them outside, a child has an amazing experience where they feel finite get a lot bigger. A child could look at the stars and have no clue what infinity is. Until a child learns how to count and really goes off on a whim and tries to count as high as they possibly can, do they realize what infinity might even conceptually be? And because of this natural growth pattern, where a child will think that if it rains outside, it rains everywhere. They talk to grandma a thousand miles away, like, grandma, it's raining. What do you think about that? And grandma's like, it ain't raining here. What do you mean it's not raining here? And they learn this concept of two different locations. I was lucky that both my grandparents, plus all their aunts and uncles, lived in the same town. My parents lived in the same town. My high school, you know, my father, my mother, my aunts, my uncles, and my grandmother went to the same high school I went to. Awesome. Swimming pool. But I went and became a lifeguard at the swimming pool. Well, my whole family had been lifeguards at that pool. Okay. But the beautiful thing about a township is that one, a six mile square is fairly easy to memorize. And very seldom in the Midwest region where I am from does the full six miles get fully occupied. There's at least a good 20 to 30 percent that is a field or a big college or someone just has a, a warehouse on a big plot of land. Some of it's just completely undeveloped. It's got a highway going through it or something. And so imagine you are trying to gain paradigm and faculties to take in life and live it. You're a child. You're vulnerable. But you feel comfortable in your bedroom with all of your toys because a child can memorize where the bed is, where all the toys are. And then they have to memorize the outer hallway in the front room and the kitchen. And then, then they start venturing into the front yard, the backyard. And that can be kind of daunting at first, kind of scary at first, right? Then you feel comfortable as you get older and dominate. Your, brain, your brain's ability to hold more capacity at the same time, conscious thought, increases. So the first beautiful thing about a small town is this sort of a miniature city? Why do people like Disneyland downtown? Because it's a miniature, like one seventh, uh, sorry, no, seven ninths or five sevenths, uh, I think it's five sevenths scale town based on the Missouri town that Walt Disney's from. It feels like you can control it, it feels like it's warming. You know, plus, by the time you are born into these towns, typically, unless, you know, you were part of the settlers in the 1800s, every single business is owned and the fact, the, uh, sorry, the, the resources of life are all taken care of. There's a grocery store, a drug store, a clothing store, a shoe store, etc., etc. The car repair place, a couple of different restaurants, not a hell of a lot, but there it is. Everything that a town needs to sustain its existence is usually embedded into a town. Until Walmart shows up and fucks everything up, but whatever. So the nice thing is, is that if you look at most of the folks that suffer from childhood ailments of mental abuse, which again, could be something severe, could be something very mild. You know, father or mother wasn't, uh, you know, the, the child could never do anything to make the, the parent happy. Those are the little ones that, that leave you constantly trying to overcompensate your whole life. You kind of, kind of become an annoying human being when that happens, right, to other people. But now let's just say that as a small town, because you realize that in a small town you have a small population. My town's heyday was 12,500. I think I lived through that era in the, in the 70s and 80s. I think now it's about 10,000 or a little less you realize that you know a tremendous amount of the town. And there's two ways, you know, that you know someone. You have an acquaintance that you see drive by you and you wave. You go to school with kids and you meet the whole classroom. You play after school in safe neighborhoods because all the parents are working together to watch the kids. No one's worried about a perv, right? All the dads work together somewhere downtown, somewhere in the industrial park outside of town. 
And so there's this beautiful sense of relaxation. There might be competitiveness in the town, but there's no fear in the town. You don't have murder. You don't have crime. They didn't lock doors of houses or cars until probably the late 80s in my hometown. And even then, a lot of people still don't do it to this day. When I grew up there, drugs were very mild and very sparse. Drinking, sure. Plenty of drink holes in town, but that's sort of the mainstay that came out of, you know, a hundred years of previous history, right? But a child grows up centered. And when you grow up centered, okay, and there's always a kid in town that had a bad trip, and they had a bad group of parents or what have you, and they're the exception. It's unfortunate that it happens. It doesn't matter how rich you are, how poor you are in a small town. You could have a bad batch of parents who may, maybe the parents pull their head out eventually, but during the time they had those kids, they were screwing them up, right? I know them all. I know all these different folks. And my parents weren't perfect either. But imagine that you didn't have any outside stress on you from your environment. You didn't have to worry about gunshots at night, terrorists or drugs or muggers or perverts or anything. So then... You get a lot of freedom. Freedom to explore your environment. Freedom to explore yourself. Freedom to, to explore friendships and relationships with other people without the stress of peril. I can't stress this enough that that is what gives someone a center core in their being that they will carry the rest of their lives. Even if something bad happens to them 10, 20 years later, they still have their core to reflect on to say, well, this only happened to me because I'm in this different location. It only happened to me because I have these bad friends of mine or this bad relationship I got into. I can always go home and, and live with people that don't do this to each other, right? Whether that be true or not, you can usually find some place that's similar. It also feeds into overall confidence, it's always strange to me that when I come to the big city and uh, I was, it was, it happened to me the other day. I was in some restaurant. I think I was at a Chick-fil-A. I hadn't eaten there in a long time and I wanted to taste it. Boy, it was delicious. Oh my God. But I went in there and there's a kid in there who's probably, I don't know, six foot three. Great genetics. You can see him. He's just, he's built like a warrior. And he had his girlfriend there, I think. And... He's young. He's probably between 18 and 20, somewhere in there. But he was the meekest kid I'd ever seen. I mean, he carried himself like he had just, like someone's going to beat him up in the next second. It was really strange. And I'm looking at him going, geez, you have the genetics to be a fucking gladiator. Why are you walking around like a pussy? It's weird. Something happened to that kid. I don't know what it was. This was way beyond being gracious and, and confident. Uh, this was insecurity. In my hometown, kids that size are typically very, very confident. The women are confident. The boys are confident. The girls are confident. Right? Everyone is encouraged to be the very best they could possibly be. Now, is there gossip and politics and all that kind of stuff? I mean, I mean not politics as in national politics, but the, you know, who's better than who and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, there's always a little smidgen of that, right? There's also something called nostalgia that starts to form in a small town. The level of familiarity in a town is interesting. I'm going to give you kind of a weird analogy, but a friend of mine does a lot of woodworking, and he's always teaching me new things about it, and he said that the Japanese have a ritual once a year where carpenters will will create things. I don't think it's just wood, but wood is definitely one of them. They'll make little boxes, little jewelry boxes and things. And they, they have this big uh, arena or something where they bring all these boxes and lay them out. And they have like 10,000 people go through and touch them with their hands to patina the wood, to smooth it out. You know, like you go to Disneyland, you touch a few of the guardrails that have been there for 50, 60 years. And it's just like, wow, this is like... This is, Walt Disney touched this thing, you know. Same thing on these boxes. And it makes it have this special 
value to the mind. And I'm not sure exactly what the deal is. If part of our soul comes up on these things, and that's why something that's older has that feeling. But it happens in a small town. Businesses, the the faces, you know, the storefronts on these businesses, depending on if they've been renewed or if they've just been re-inhabited by a different business, they have that patina, that history, that lineage, and thus the respect of their existence. We had a little tiny breakfast cafe called the Busy Bee Cafe, which is right next to the railroad tracks. If any of you jump into Google Maps, um, it's fully photographed because we have a Google Map um, headquarters right downtown. I've said this a couple times, but when the PC version of Google Maps was ported, or Google Earth, excuse me, was ported to the Macintosh, a kid named David Webb, I think is his name, ported it and set the coordinate directly on Chinook, Kansas. So if you launched on a Mac, supposedly that's what happened. I've never had that actually happen on my Google Earth, but uh, whatever. So Google came and sponsored this big mosaic that's on the center of Maine and Lincoln. But if you go over to the railroad tracks, a little bit west, about a block, you'll see this Busy Bee Cafe, which is now no longer in use as far as I know. But it used to be a place where you would go and eat breakfast. And I remember being taken there in high school. And this is where nostalgia comes in. And how does it start? How does nostalgia start in the mind? I'm going to do an episode probably about nostalgia this year. But the big deal was that, you know, my father would take me in there. He'd say, you know what? This place has been here since I was a little kid. I ate here as a child. Your grandfathers ate here when they were young men. Everybody came here. Everyone who's ever been in Chanute and lived here has eaten breakfast here. And it's a teeny tiny little submarine bar, you know, like a, like, a, like a cafe. And so at that point, you start looking around. And it's not exactly, I don't remember being the cleanest place on earth, but it was a heirloom to the town. Now, it was one of the older locations, but if you just subtract a year off its, off its age and start introducing the next line of... Um, buildings and businesses, then you have a bunch of these. It is very special to live in a place, and you Europeans, you know this, Jesus, you got buildings that are like 800 years old and you rent them and live in them, right? It's amazing. That's one thing I love about overseas. But for America, an old town is uh, starts about 1850 and up. It's pretty much an old town. You go to the East Coast, you're talking about 1600s, you know, 1700s. So what ends up happening is you start to trust the locations inside your town as a child, as a teenager. Oh, this is a busy bee cafe, man. This is where my grandparents eat. I can trust the food. I can trust the people. It's comforting. It's cool. And then you start looking around the town and you start realizing, oh my God, you know, these storefronts and these roads and these buildings, some of them have been there over a hundred years by the time I was, you know, cognitive in the 70s and 80s. 120, 130 year old buildings. As a child, you'll start looking at it and going, geez, the craftsmanship that we had back in those days is amazing. As you live and buy and rent homes, you know, you probably have a one in three chance of getting into a, a home that's a hundred years old. Amazing. So there's an environmental thing. That's what that's all about. The psychological environmental comfort zone of the location of a small town. By the way, before I even get any further, um, if you grew up in a small town and this is rekindling your own nostalgia for your own town. Share it where you grew up and just tell us a little bit about your town. The cool parts that made you who you are today, you know. But then there's the social element of it all. Now there's a saying that became very uh, cliche, which is it takes a village to raise a kid. And Hillary Clinton, of all people, I think she, didn't she write that book that had the same name or something, right? It's true. It's a thousand percent true. What is wrong with the world today? Well, a lot of things are wrong in this world today, but I will tell you that one of the core things 
core things, driven by other core things, but one of the core things that we can talk about in this world is called accountability. When you're in a fast-paced world, there's very little accountability. Let's say you drove down the 405 in Los Angeles and you flipped off 10 people with your finger. But you picked people that you, you know, like an old grandma, an old grandpa, someone that looks meek, so you're not going to get chased down and shot. The likelihood of you ever seeing that person again mathematically is zero. I mean, it is, <laughs> if you round it up the five decimal places after the decimal point, you, or five zeros after the decimal point, you wouldn't, uh, you still be at zero. So you can be an asshole in a big town, and yet, because there is no accountability. In a small town, boy, you couldn't pick anybody to flip off without getting your ass, you know, in trouble. Reputationally speaking, maybe even physically, depending on what you do. And so there's this interesting trade-off. I can be well thought of in town. I can get any girl that likes me to date me. I can get any job in town as long as I do one thing. Remain accountable to my fellow township citizens. Because if I do anything bad, it's going to spread like a virus. Did you hear what he did? Boy, you know how stories get more sensationalized as they get retold. So could you imagine doing, you know, flipping the bird to somebody, and then by the time the story gets back to you, you, you know, pounded them in the face with your fist, you know. But here's the interesting thing. I'm making a weird example, flipping somebody off. But that doesn't happen in a small town unless you're friends, right? You know, in high school, it was one of these things of buddies would flip each other off all the time. I don't know why we did that. It doesn't sound that funny to me at all anymore, but we did. But you didn't want to do it in a way that an old lady would see you. Do it. You didn't cuss in front of old people or anyone else that would tell your parents that you did such a thing. You wouldn't do it for the sake of getting in trouble with your parent, but you also wouldn't do it simply because you didn't want anyone to think that you were that flexible with your discipline as a human being. That you can go from speaking clean for your grandmother and totally filthy for your best friend. Now, I can only speak for myself in this particular regard. But one might ask, but isn't that very restrictive? Isn't that a crappy way to live that you can't be everything that you want to be the minute you want to be it? I'm going to give you two answers. One, no. It's not at all restrictive. You have no problem with the amount of benefits you get by behaving and being accountable to your township so unbelievably outweighs what you would get if you were a jerk here and there that it's easy it's totally easy especially when you meet as a boy i mean you know i met women that were or girls i should say that were just the most pristine wonderful innocent you know still feisty and interesting you know not like goody two shoes necessarily but great girls that you could date and it was a privilege and an honor to be in their presence and there's if you're the slightest bit empathetic about the situation then you are wanting to be equally fantastic for them just a natural thing at the same time in a small town with all of your grandparents there if you have decent relationships with your grandparents especially the opposite sex grandparent typically grandmas always get the get the win but you want to be a good son, grandson for your family members. You want them to be able to rely on you carrying the family name. And the surname in itself has a value in a small town. Whereas the surname in a big town, geez, I have not met someone in a big city since I've been in California over 30 years. I haven't met anyone who gives a shit about their surname. I'm sure that's not the truth about their surnames, but I don't hear it. And I'm going to tell you, if there's an arbitrary thing that you can pick, it's your surname. Who are you? Are you a Johnson? Are you a, a Lowe? Are you, what are you? Well, that's who you are. 
And even if your parents aren't somebody that you think upheld that surname value, you can be the first generation to bring it back in a while. But I guarantee you, over 100 years ago, 150 years ago, your surname with your family members meant everything. How many times do you hear about the Irish quoting their surnames and saying, you know, I was an O'Reilly, I was an O'Brien, and they're proud. I was a Scottish Bruce. They're proud. Why is it that the elite of the world that run the world are proud of their surnames? It's a mechanism by which they discipline themselves to gain such power. But they gain it for control and negativity. Why don't we do it for the common law and prosperity? The other thing you get from a small town is its natural constraints on you. Very few small towns have millionaires. Now, technically, uh, there are millionaires in small towns called farmers. Yes, they live a little bit above some folks, but they have a hard life, okay? They get up at the crack of dawn. They're out working before most city kids are even remotely close to getting up to go to school. Just like the Marines. They've done more before you woke up than you'll do the rest of your day. It's true. Now, their combines, their farm, their land, their feed, their whatever, cost millions and millions of dollars per year. So technically speaking, farmers are millionaires because they have to play with that kind of money. But they also have huge risks. If there's a huge frost that comes through, they could lose an entire crop for an entire year and have to live off their savings after spending all that time manicuring the land, a flood could destroy everything, especially like a soybean crop, which is a very shallow crop, right? I've seen it happen a number of times, and I felt the pain of the farmer even without understanding the true financial loss as a young man. But in the city, there are families that do a little bit better than other families. There's a lot of that keeping up appearances stuff, you know, the Jones me thing. Well, they got an IROC. Well, I need an IROC, right? Eh, that happens. But most of the uh, civilization inside of a small town has heavy constraints on their finances. What does that do? Well, a city person might say, oh, my God, I would never live in a small town. You ever been to a small town? No. What's it like? Oh, well, it's dirty, for one thing. Why is it dirty? Well, you know, half the, or a quarter of the citizens live outside of the city limits, so they're driving on dirt roads. They track that shit into town. It's just, it's just got dirt flying everywhere anyway, Right. So why would you do that? You know, when it snows, the, the snow gets dirty, right? So it's like, it's tough. It's not as clean as a, as a cement zoo like a city. But what happens is, is that the citizens have to find ways to be happy with what they have. Ask anybody who's wealthy today if they enjoy their wealth. In my experience, those who enjoy their wealth the most weren't wealthy when they were young. They know the difference between not having resources and having resources. Those that are rich from the very, very beginning usually imitate small town living. Like I've got a couple people in LA who are my mentors in various industries. I know that they're sitting on top of powder kegs of money. They've always had money. Their friends in school were the heirs of the giant corporations here in America. But they live in... 1,400 square foot homes, albeit they're in nice uh, areas, but inside it's just a normal freaking house. They drive cars that are 25 years old, if not 30 years old. They don't believe in buying new stuff, so they're living like my township, even though they have the ability to roll <laughs> as hard as they want, right? Once you learn to be happy with very little there's very, very little that will make you unhappy. Now, the only thing that's actually started to penetrate this, and I'm going to get into a little bit of the transformation of these towns, but I don't want to end this on any negative notes. Let me just make a quick comment here. Back when I was a kid, the amount of amenities and electronics and appliances that one purchased for their home was still fairly reasonable in terms of price. A TV, a stereo for your house, a car, and, you know, I don't know, a particular type of blender, whatever, right? 
Overall, if you wanted one, maybe you had to save up a couple months, maybe six months if you wanted a fancier one. But the world's changed a little bit now where products actually have been injected into society. The latest iPhone Max, right? iPhone 10 Max is $1,500, right? Now, it's $1,500 for me sitting in Huntington Beach, California, and it's $1,500 for my uh, hometown folks in Chinook, Kansas. Who's going to pay for that a lot easier, me or them? Obviously me, because I make a lot more money than anyone in my hometown on average, right? So if the kids want to own iPhones in my hometown, the burden on them is insane to get these things paid for because they have all the other expenses as well. A car, eh, there's a little bit of markup probably for California emissions and a few other things, but a car, when I left the, uh, my hometown in 87, the car I wanted was like a Monte Carlo SS. That's what I wanted. I think it was about $16,000 or something like that. It could go up as high as eighteen. Well, I got to California, and it was the exact same price. All right. Well, I made a hell of a lot more money in California than I ever made in, in my little hometown. So I could afford the car in California, but I couldn't afford the car in my hometown. But let's back up one second. Did I really need that car? No, <laughs> I didn't need that car at all. What am I doing? I'm driving around a town that's six miles square. When I was an early teenager, I had a, um, a Honda moped. It was pretty awesome. It's one of the more tricked out looking ones. And I'd ride the piss out of that thing all around town. But I could do the whole square. I was probably doing a five mile square instead of a six mile square. And just over and over and over, listening to music, stopping by friends' houses, whatever. Crashed it a couple times. I was happy. My first car was a Dodge Charger Special Edition, 1976, eggshell white. If you want to know what it looks like, it ain't the General Lee, folks. It's like your mom's Cordoba. I got around. Got to work. But what brought me happiness was the interaction with my friends, the interaction with my family, the interaction with my girlfriend. That's what made me happy. Going to a movie together. And sharing our opinions about the film. Going to a picnic. You know, I was young. We go to dances and that kind of thing, right? You didn't have a bunch of money, but no one else did either. So it was a level playing field. We didn't have an ice cream chuck, though, I'll tell you that. And what was interesting was we had a guy in town who bought a Ferrari. He was sort of an outer... Uh, I, I don't know if he grew up in my hometown then moved there, or sorry, moved in from out of town or if he grew up there. He had this really weird Ferrari convertible. It had a really short front with this rear engine thing and just odd looking. But he drove around town and it was kind of special to see this guy drive that Ferrari around town. Really bizarre, right? When someone bought a new Corvette, the new Corvettes in 84, it was amazing to see one. Well, in the big city, I can tell you the only thing that really turns in my head is like a, uh, a Lamborghini Aventador with the special horsepower package on it. You know, that's the part that turns my head. It takes a lot to turn my head here in California. A chrome-covered Aston Martin, you know, that's just a, an anomaly for the eyes to see. So the subtleties of being impressed were more plentiful in a small town than they are in the big, big city, Right. Now, one of the things that I got wrong as a kid, I've mentioned this a couple times, we're on the subject. I thought all the city kids had all the opportunity. Some of that's correct, some of that's not correct. But I thought that they were smarter. And that when I would get to the, the coast, I thought, man, I'm going to be dumb compared to these kids. And when I got out here, it was quite the opposite experience. Because I was isolated in the middle of nowhere, 100 miles from any major city, roughly, like Joplin is the only one that's slightly closer, at about 70 miles or so. And because I didn't have any brothers or sisters, that also helped me out a little bit. I had a couple cousins, but I wasn't like, you know, we weren't spending every day together or anything like that. I would hunker down in all my studies. 
you know, just self-educating like crazy, reading the encyclopedia, uh, the world encyclopedia, getting into programming, getting into drawing and painting and music, everything. So by the time I came to California, I had a college level education in programming. I had a college level, at least level of illustration and drawing, both digital and analog. And I was just dangerous in the music area. Hadn't started writing yet. But I also had a work ethic. And so when I came to the coast, I was dominating fast, super duper fast. And I was shocked. I almost couldn't believe how easy it was. Now, obviously, you get this in the major cities as well, because you do have kids that nerd out at home. And that's where you get a lot of the folks that, that control the planet in terms of creating products and refining things. It's very cool. But when I look at the work ethic thing, it's very interesting. Now, work ethic comes out of the cultural demands of your environment, right? If your environment says kids behave and kids think employment is a privilege, if that's what the culture thinks, then that's what the culture does. They're nice and courteous. In California, it's a hit and miss situation. You go to an in and out burger, and I don't know what interview piece of paper they have, but they find the, the most incredibly awake, good kids. They're all races, they're all creeds. They just pluck them right out of the world. Oh, there's a really good kid right there. Boom, bam, you're gonna make hamburgers. In the Midwest, it's almost every kid because every kid is afraid that they won't be able to pay for things. Jobs aren't as plentiful in the Midwest. You have a few restaurants, a few businesses you can work at. And so you're lucky to get a job. That might sound a little restrictive, but the nice thing is, is that, one, you can usually stay in careers for the rest of your life if you want to in the Midwest. You can move in from being a burger flipper to being the manager, and then you can become some regional manager. I mean, you can keep moving up no matter what you're doing. But I think it goes just a little bit deeper than that for a township. There's something called pride. And it is how well do you do your job in general? Because it is the definition in a small town that will eventually link back to your surname. The more I think about my history of listening to various critiques, be it positive or negative, about various people in the hometown that I grew up in, the amount of times that it was linked back to a person's name. And honestly, it was... Uh, like, we have um, a couple companies in our town. Young's Welding, just like being young, that's the last name. Young's Welding is known for being a an ace company that if you need anything built, welded together, some machinery created, they are just famous in my hometown for being super high quality. There's some families in my hometown, which I don't even know if still exist, uh, that will go utterly nameless, and I don't really have any close association with them at all, but there were some families that seemed to just raise bad kids. They're always in trouble. They're always uh, in and out of jail. Some of them, I know one family that was responsible for killing uh, three people. And it all happened in a one-year like, one span. It was one sibling and then another sibling. I think one person killed two people. They only killed one person or maybe they only killed one apiece, but they absolutely maimed they did it in front of the families it was all being drunk and on drugs and driving their cars into people in front of everyone one was an extremely public situation and so that family just gets scarred which for one of the kids who had nothing to do with those two events he's kind of screwed because he's like oh my god now i have to prove i'm not one of the the other kids in my family but I know that kid too and <clears throat> he had his own version of it he had his own version of being a pain in the ass the father was sort of a piece of shit who was always one of these guys that tried to cheat everyone out of everything and he taught his kids you don't need to follow rules rules are for suckers right but instead of being smart about it they just 
had the worst judgment on earth. I think the family actually moved out of town before the last kid graduated, I believe. And so what's interesting about it is the town can turn on selective uh, warnings and concerns and cautions. So if one of those kids showed up at a bar, showed up at some public event, the town can just start to go, okay, they're here, so let's be careful. Let's watch them. Let's see if they drink too much and get in a car. We'll call the cops, get them at least off the street. But most of us aren't those people. Most of us have no history of that behavior. And so there's no caution. It also helps you figure out who the hell you're going to invite. If a bank's going to give a loan to somebody for a business, well, they'll just go, oh, uh, your family has been here for 80 to 100 years. You have been a cornerstone of this community. I know your grandfather and your great-grandfather, they're all wonderful people. Boom, you get the loan. I trust you. I trust that if you have a problem paying the loan, that your family will kick in and help you get through bad times, right? Maybe even will kick in and give you a reprieve on your payments if the whole town is suffering, right? How many times have you driven down a highway at night and someone's stranded on the side of the road? You can see they have a flat tire. Perhaps they're carrying a gas can up the highway. And you can't imagine pulling over to help them. Or all you can do is perhaps imagine, but you can't stomach the risk of maybe getting beat up or mugged or something by someone in some feral state of concern in the big city. Happens all the time, folks. In a small town, it's different. In a small town, you look over there and you go, well, that's Fred Johnson. Let's, let's uh, wow, it looks like he's got a tire thing. So you pull over, you know, you roll down your window because it's like 30 miles an hour everywhere in town. You can look in your rearview mirror and see if anyone's going to come up on you in the next 60 seconds to five minutes. Hey, Fred, you doing okay? Yeah, damn it, I got us, you know, got a flat tire. You got a spare? Yeah, is it is it aired up? Yeah, you need anything from me? No, I'm good. You sure? Okay. You got my cell number? Yeah. All right, you give me a call if you have any problems. All right, thanks a lot. Boom, you're on your way. The person needs help, needs a gas can filled up when they're not, they're in the middle of town, there's no gas station. I mean, you feel me, right? Hop in, lock yourself up, hop in, we'll get you taken care of. Boom. That can happen in a small town. Easy. Some of you live in these towns and you're looking at me like, yeah, what is your big mystification about this? It's because in the big city it ain't like that, right? This is the reason why getting rid of the electoral college in America is absolutely fucking insane. Because people with morals and responsibility and accountability are those people in those communities and they need equal representation in a major country because they're going to keep you centered. You know, where Simi Valley was the porn capital of California, you won't find that in the Midwest that easy. Oh, you know, there's, there's guys that try it. There's guys that do it. But by God, they are hiding. They are hiding that activity like crazy, right? Now, the one commonality that's starting to take root and it, it's a constant battle with the Midwest small towns. I just got another update from a, an acquaintance of mine in my hometown. Is drugs. Now people in small towns can't really afford heroin. They can't afford cocaine. You know, people do it but they're they're living on the edge of their financial capabilities. But things like meth have um attempted several times to take root in my hometown because it's cheap. Your average peasant can make it, right? It's a multi-pronged problem in that when we used to have, um, well, when we didn't have Walmart, when we didn't have fast food chains in our hometown, then everyone provided those services to the citizens. Now, the citizens actually pat themselves on the back that they were lucky enough to get the Walmart, lucky enough to get these big franchises in there, not realizing the entire time that all the money is going outside the town. 
and not coming back in. Sure, people get paychecks, but when has anyone, you know, ran outside with the Walmart paycheck and said, oh my God, I won the lottery. So it has taken a prosperous town that was at 12,500 and counting going up. And at one point, I think it fell below 9,000 people. When I went back for my, I think my second high school reunion, my 20th, I had my old friends and I was like, hey, what's up? How's, how's life? How's it going? And they just looked dead. And their reasoning for that, you know, that sort of melancholy, macabre personality was that they were having a problem finding work. They're not dumb people. Very educated. Had, had jobs. But these organizations came in and destroyed their grocery stores, destroyed their businesses that have been there for 80 years. So why do drugs get into small towns? Well, we'll, we'll overlook Charlotte Iserby's The Dumbing Down of America reason why, which is to utterly destroy the town. The biggest agenda that she revealed were the corporations that were coming in to take over all of our businesses. That was an agenda hatched in the early 70s. But you either need money or you need to be happy. Depending on how much you adopt the have-to-be-rich culture of America, you have to have stuff. You have to have that iPhone Max or you're not going to be happy. You have to have the 80-inch 4K HDR television. It goes 3D. To the degree you adopt those standards, you're never going to have enough money unless you're one of the few in our hometown to have your own business and you're able to really push through a lot of cash, right? That's pretty rare. That's pretty rare. So if you were down and out, you could move in, sorry, you could, you could start dealing in meth or some other drug. I don't think weed is, is legal yet in Kansas, so you would have to still smuggle that in. Whatever anyone wants. You get it in there and you resell it and you put your little upcharge on it. And there you go. You made some money. For the buyers... They're probably down and out, and man, I just need a little hit. I need a little something to give me a boost because I can't find a job. A job I have I don't like. Man, this place used to be great, and now it's not great anymore. So that's the way it's sneaking in. It's a sad thing. Because the fabric of these people still exists. The goodness in them still exists. The work ethic still exists. The camaraderie and respect and accountability still exists. But it brings to mind a little statement that JFK said, which is, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. That's a sensibility that I think is waning in the Midwest. People willing to take responsibility for what has either helped their town or injured their town. I think it would be utterly fascinating if everyone in my hometown said, you know what? Regardless of the expense that I'm going to go to, and we can all work together to cabal uh, cheaper products, we're not going to shop at Walmart anymore. We're just going to let it go down the tubes. And then as, and we're also going to start new stores to sell the things that they sell. And yeah, we know it's cheaper at Walmart. We also know it's lesser products, products that are built to fall apart. Shoes and only allowed to last six months before they explode. Food that is unhealthy for you because it's all GMO. We're going to harvest our own stuff. GMO, we're going to get rid of that too. My whole town is full of GMO crops now. One of the main reasons why they can't see the deception is because they don't think in deception. They don't deceive each other to survive. So when the corporations come in with a complete deception model of prosperity... Hey, the toilet paper is a lot cheaper at Walmart. Why would you buy it down at uh, the food mart? It costs more down there. Why would you do that? Oh, I don't know. Okay, yeah, I guess I should buy it for cheaper. Not realizing they're putting a grocery store out of business downtown. One of the grocery stores turned into a feed store for farmers. One of the grocery stores turned into a nightclub. One of them is just derelict and empty. I think one turned into a liquor store. Liquor being another drug, right? There's only a couple original grocery stores, I think, that are, still exist when I was a kid. 
Now, I don't know if what I'm about to mention is a huge problem for my hometown, but I've seen little inklings of it in conversation, during visits, which is the... I'm going to give you the analogy of the old Twilight Zone, where there's this community of people having a birthday party for one of the doctors who's got a wife and a son, and they're giving him a bunch of crap about having built a bomb shelter below his house, how they all had to put up with the sound of him doing this construction, how silly he was for building this. And then his son runs in the room and says, Dad, they're saying something on the television or on the radio. I think it was the television. But they turn it on. It was a radio. And it says that bombs are coming in from Russia and that the nuclear war has begun. And everyone rushes home. And then they all realize, oh, my God, we need to be in the shelter because we're not going to survive a nuclear attack. Now, the old guy is grabbing water, grabbing all the stuff, going down inside his, his shelter. It's only built for three people. He closes the door. Everyone's begging to go in. One family has a, has a child. He says, we should go in there because we have a little kid. And another person goes, what makes your kid more valuable than mine just because it's younger? So there's all this fighting. Then there's racism that starts. All this kind of proprietary elitism starts to occur in the conversation. And eventually they tear open the door, destroy the shelter itself. So now they're all at risk. They're all going to die. And then it comes on the radio that it was all a false alarm. And they have to look at each other and go, Oh my God, I said all those horrible things about you. As long as little towns incur small problems, they won't get to that level. But if they incur giant recessions, or God forbid, a depression. And again, it doesn't have to be something that's national, right? Both coasts could be booming the whole time. Prosperity is great. But as long as Walmarts are opened up in every little town, it's that sucking sound. It's a NAFTA sucking sound. It's pulling all the money out of the town and sending it to Europe or India or China where the products are made. We have to protect. Trust me. We have to protect our little towns. We have to protect them like the gyroscope that holds, you know, something steady the centrifuge of a giant skyscraper that holds it steady when the wind is hitting it, right? The coasts are the chaotic cultural development zones where mistakes are going to be made and great things are going to be made all at the same time. But they're sort of what have you done for me lately cultures. I live in this culture. I've lived in it for over 30 years. They get off on bad trends. And a lot of folks can see the bad trend right away and go, man, this is a horrible idea. We need to stop this or we need not to give them our money, give this thing our money. And it balances back out. In a small town, they don't often engage in such a thing. So instead of seeing rural communities as sort of Hollywood bumpkin things, and believe me, believe me, they, Hollywood knows that the Midwest is a threat to their perversion. And so why do they greenlight scripts that cast the Midwest as a bunch of bumpkins, a bunch of idiots? Because that's the benefit they get. They get to keep their chaos, their perversion. Nothing worse than a person who's made so much money that no matter what happens to the economy, they're always going to be rich. Their perversion is always protected. You could live in the exact same zone. You don't have such freedoms. The economy crashes you lose everything. They don't, you do. But they're painting reality through fictional television, fictional film, all that stuff, right? I think this last presidential election in America, the Midwest finally realized, well, you city folk have gotten a little out of fucking control. The Midwest cities have crime out the ass. You know, Los Angeles has largely gained a lot of control over its shootings and all of its gang banging because we went hardcore. We took it to 11. By 1996, L.A. was a bloodbath. The amount of deaths every single night was just commonplace. Drive-bys. I mean, you were lucky if only one happened in a night. It got so chaotic that the, that the West Coast said, ah, I think we got to pull back here. I don't want to die. 
for some stupid reason. We need to understand society a lot better than we do. Small towns, no matter where they are, typically have a level of camaraderie that, again, is self-correcting. If you think about it like the human body, for instance, you don't want your autonomic system that takes care of your heartbeat and your brain waves and your nervous system to ever be screwed with, do you? That should work perfect constantly. Now you might drink some alcohol to mess with it a little bit and have some fun, drop some LSD. You wouldn't do it every single day probably unless you have a chronic sickness. So it's the outside of your body that'll go on the roller coaster. It wants to do all kinds of crazy chaotic stuff, but you want your insides to work great. I think we can view the coastal regions as sort of the external epidermis on the American, it's the only perspective I can give you, culture. But the center, the heart, the brain, the nervous system is all of that Midwest energy. It's all that Midwest sensibility and accountability and beauty and simplicity. Tell me where you live. Whether you live in a big city that, you know, rocks hard or whatever you guys do, or you live in a little tiny town that has gone through these various cycles. What's cool about every single town, meaning little town, is that if you stop by in your car and you pull over and you're kind and you're courteous, they might look at you a little funny the smaller the town is because they really do fear outsiders. They don't want your shit in their town. They've got balance. They've got synergy. They don't want your chaotic thought, your perversion. So they'll check you out for a little while, ask you a few questions to see... Is this guy going to rob the bank? Is he going to impregnate all the daughters? You know, is he going to spread a venereal disease because he's part of that clan? You know, they'll be careful with you. But once you get inside the hard shell of the egg, it's soft in the middle. And they'll start telling you everything about their hometown. And there's always some inceptual moment that made the town exist. How did this town come about? My town came about because of the railroad. Once the railroad became a ubiquitous part of the town's flow, freight going through, passengers going through, well then the town itself could build its own culture around that. Well, that's taken care of. The railroad that brings in all this cash has this thing. Well, we need a downtown. We need all the amenities of life. We need a dry cleaners, a restaurant, and da 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 That's why I think people jump in RVs and cross America, even if you're from Europe. I don't know where to go in Europe. Europe has been there for so freaking long. That there's no, to my knowledge, there's no little towns in Europe that haven't existed for a thousand to two thousand years, right? So it's it's a little tougher, but they have the same element. Every little town, every big town in Europe has an amazing story. An amazing story. Well, the simplicity of Americans in the Midwest is sort of an heirloom of beauty. When you get a really good, nicely balanced town. I think my hometown is one of those towns. That's why people from California and around the world tend to move to my hometown once they figure out it exists and they come and they do a little vacation there and they realize, geez, it took me two or three days to slow down my tempo where 30 miles an hour everywhere seemed like a decent uh, you know, miles per hour to drive, but they relax and they de-stress and they sleep at night. They'll still go to the big city and, and enjoy their friends and all the amenities of New York and L.A. and whatever, wherever they're from. But the what was it, the basis of the movie Beetlejuice was that uh, this really intense East Coast family moved to this sort of kind of well-lived-in sort of burbia. I don't know where that was actually set. Their goal was to bring some of their amenities to their home and live. That was their thing. Turn the town into a sanctuary. Or rich people could come and just relax, right? I'm telling you, it happens every single day. California is a tough place to live in, depending on what stage of life you're in. The amount of friends I have that say they're going to get out of this state is getting more and more and more. Most of these kids grew up here. I think it's interesting. The pattern of L.A. has sort of worn off, I guess. So it's not this coveted thing anymore. I talk to people in my hometown 
And some people absolutely love it and want to live their rest of their lives. And some folks, some folks are just like, I want to get the hell out of here. The drugs are getting out of control. I don't exactly know what that means at this point. About uh, 10, 15 years ago, I saw the problem and then it seemed to go away. And I guess from at least one person's perspective, it's back with force. So we'll see, right? I hope this was valuable. If you're st stuck in a big city, especially. If you're in a big city and you're pulling your hair out, you have kids and you're really fearful for how they're raised, maybe look into a small town. Maybe it's close to your big city. So you can make a little commute. Maybe you just uproot everything and you go to a place and you find yourself a little job. You enjoy the peaceful nature of not worrying about whether or not you're going to get robbed blind. Honestly, if you're from a big city and you move to a small town, the cool thing is is that your instincts and your, your sensory input is going to be so much more hyper than theirs that you could see danger a mile away. But don't be surprised if you don't sense any, right? When you live there five, ten years and you haven't heard about a single house getting burglarized that wasn't like the neighbor's kid who crawled over and stole his, you know, the neighbor's wrench or lawnmower or whatever. You know, a bicycle might get stolen. whoop de doo right? Where are you going to ride a bicycle in a town that you stole it in? Right? You can't. You have to take it to the town over because someone will recognize the bike. Let me know your stories. Let's share a little bit of communion. This probably won't get that many views, but uh, for those of you who finished it, I think you'll sense the value in it. Anyhow, if you haven't been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please go. There's audio, video, a locked Facebook group, a Patreon page. Appreciate you guys stopping by. Take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over now. <laughs>